This is UCAP News with Nicole Stilger. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with a warning from Lloyd Minster RCMP. Travel of any kind not recommended. Drivers asked to avoid the highway altogether. Complete whiteout conditions have been reported throughout the Lloydminster Vermilion areas. Multiple accidents have been reported along the highway. RCMP have advised westbound Highway 16 from 80th Ave to Vermilion now closed. Environment Canada issued a blowing snow advisory along with an extreme cold warning for Lloydminster, Bonneville, Cold Lake, St. Paul and Lac La Biche. There are also reports from police about a 10 car pileup near Clandonald. And the village of Neilburg has a tragic history of businesses going up in flames. The most recent victim was a meat processing plant just outside of the community, which caught fire this Saturday. Gina Martin spoke with the owners of the business who are dealing with this sort of setback for a second time. From the entrance, business appears as usual for North 40 meat processing. But beyond the trees reveals the shell of a once successful abattoir. Shadden Lane saw first sight of the smoke Saturday evening that would soon ravage the inside of the building. The day before had been really, really foggy here, and I thought, don't tell me it's going to be foggy again, so I opened the door. It wasn't fog, and that smell, it just came right back. Basically, about 10 minutes later, the fire trucks and that started showing up, and I hardly had time to get my winter clothes on and get back out there, and they were here, but there was, I mean, it was a matter of of trying to save any other thing because we pretty much knew that was gone instantly. The plant served around four to 500 people spanning over a 100 kilometer radius. It was our livelihood, which, I mean, you get up in the morning and what do I do? It was our son's livelihood. Um, what does he do? All of it, I got no job. And there's like, there's still people phoning. I, oh, I just, I'm, what are we gonna do now? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, this isn't the first time the Lanes have seen one of their businesses catch fire, as they used to own a grocery store in Neilburg. We bought it in 1999, and in 2000, March of 2004, it burned to the ground. Honestly, um, it's yeah. But the lanes are resilient thanks to help from their friends and neighbors who never hesitate to lend a helping hand. This yard was full of firefighting equipment and people and neighbors within less than an hour. Soup and sandwiches and coffee for the firefighters. So we have such an incredible community here, it's unbelievable. It's just, there's so much support from everyone. It's just unbelievable. The lanes are taking it day by day right now and are looking forward to sunnier days ahead. We'll just keep putting one foot in front of the other and get all the details and figured out and hopefully something comes up for our son to be able to find employment and we'll be okay. Gina Martin, New Cap News. Research conducted by the RCMP has linked illicit drug use to crime in a number of ways. As of 2013, one in every 20 incidents reported by police was primarily drug-related, including people either under the influence of illicit drugs or for the purpose of acquiring illegal drugs. Gerard Lampau continues the conversation with Alberta's Justice Minister on the drug economy. Let's turn now to treatment issues and how we can speed up wait times for an addict to get themselves into rehab. So currently the government has invested about four and a half million dollars in increasing treatment beds. So that's about 50 additional treatment beds and that's a significant increase relative to what's uh, going on, was going on under the previous government. Uh, in addition, we've increased about 250 spots for opioid re replacement therapy. And so what the evidence tells us, so I understand what you're saying that it's a humanist concern and I think it is a humanist concern, but what the evidence tells us is that's also the best way to address the criminality. Uh, so ensuring that those people have access to treatment uh, also uh, decreases their, their chance of recidivism. So that actually uh, is the best way uh, we think forward from both perspectives. Madam Minister, coming back to the situation of Red and finding themselves caught between the criminal outflow between Edmonton and Calgary, Lloydminster is in a similar situation like that. What policy decisions can we look at going forward that can help out smaller jurisdictions like Lloydminster? 
So certainly it has been the case that we've seen uh, some movement in terms of crime severity index in Alberta, and I think that's a concern to us. It's a concern to police chiefs as well. Uh, so they're definitely moving to address that. Again, I think the important piece of this is to ensure that, first of all, we're following what the evidence says uh, in terms of decreasing criminality, and second of all, uh, that we're ensuring that criminal resources are focused on that which is more most important. So, um, you know, our first step towards that was to ensure that we're not enforcing by way of warrant and jail uh, something like a, a, a failure to pay your uh, transit fare. Um, so, so ensuring that the criminal system isn't being used for those uh, less severe matters so that it's in a position to focus uh, in terms of more severe matters. In Edmonton, we're seeing an increase in homicide as to the exact connection between that and the drug economy. That is uncertain, but certainly the drug economy does come with its increase in gang violence. Madam Minister, as a policy maker, what steps can you put in place to curb that eventuality from happening? So again, I think that when we're dealing with uh, drug addiction, so if what you're talking about is people um, who are addicted to drugs and as a result they're engaging in other criminal behaviors, and I think uh, there's some evidence that that's the case, uh, really, again, what you need to be uh, looking at is ensuring that we have the best evidence-based approach, and the evidence uh, continues to show us that increasing those treatment beds, uh, increasing access to opiate replacement therapies so that those people can receive treatment and they can go on to be productive members of society uh, is one of the best ways to address that. Um, you know, in addition, this province invests uh, significantly more, so we flow more money to municipalities and we invest more in policing uh, than most of our Western neighbors. Um, so uh, that certainly, I think, has an impact as well. We have the alert model, which uh, does a really good job of ensuring uh, that intelligence is flowing as between communities so it can keep a handle on those sort of more um, uh, trafficking-based aspects, so the sort of gun aspects like that. And so uh, those things, I think, all work together uh, very well to, uh, to, to deal with the problem. Gerard Lampau, Newcap News. Well, of course, as we know, extreme cold warnings continue to plague Lloydminster and area, making it that much more important to maintain your vehicle. Josh Ryan shares some reminders to keep your engine running. It's well beyond freezing in the border city, with wind chill making temperatures feel like minus 30 or colder. And that's more than chilly enough to have your car plugged in. I know GM has a special block heater end that does not work until it's minus 15, so that's a good um, indicator of when you should definitely be plugging it in. Spencer says regularly plugging in your car during the winter, especially overnight, does wonders for the long-term health of the vehicle's battery. It will definitely go a lot further, especially with our extreme weather from being plus 30 to minus 40. <laughs> there are a number of other normal maintenance checks that become even more important when it's freezing cold. Make sure your engine oil is good, brake fluid level is good, power steering fluid level, all those, all those things are always important um, no matter what time of year it is. Another step is making sure your windshield wiper fluid and coolant are appropriate for extreme cold temperatures. Sometimes you'll have coolant, it'll be full, but you test it, it's only good for minus 10 or whatever, and it could freeze. And Spencer says having winter tires can have the biggest impact of any change made to the vehicle for speeding up and slowing down. When that two or three meters is a difference between you plowing into somebody and stopping in time, that makes a huge difference. Josh Ryan. New Cap News. Well, it's a feeling we can all relate to at some point in our lives, going back to school after the holiday break. In this week's Beyond the Classroom, we see how one class at College Park School gets back in the swing of things. Derek Armstrong's class is back at it after 17 days off. It can be in phys ed. It can be in something that you do outside of school, okay? A teacher in the Lloydminster Public School Division for eight years, he knows the challenges of getting back into school mode after a break. Having the students come back and get re-energized and excited about uh, school again, um, they, they're thrilled to be here to see their friends and their, their teachers and whatnot, uh, but making sure that structure is back in their life. But it's not only an adjustment for his students. For me, just to mentally get back into it, I spent some days leading up to uh, yesterday in here and organizing and cleaning and getting myself uh, ready for the kids again. Armstrong says a big focus on the first week back in the new year is setting goals for 2017 both personally and academically.
But as for getting back to the curriculum, he says they try to keep things rolling from where they left off in December. Usually a day of kind of easing it in, making sure the kids understand that this is still a place that's an extension of their family. There's people here that care and support them. Uh, and so making them feel uh, warm and welcomed back into the building. Uh, and then it is back to business. And contrary to what you might think, the students were ready to come back. It feels like better than just like relaxing and chilling at home because like you have to like face on your main priorities at school and use your brain more. But not without some difficulty. What do you think is the most difficult part of being back in the classroom? Um, using your bra brain and just having to think again. These guys have been fantastic with kind of getting back into the swing of things and it's um, how you set up your expectations and, and communicate that there's a role for each of us here and uh, we're here to be part of a team. Well back for the 20th year the Friends of Performing Arts Lloyd Minster are preparing for another year of their signature event Mardi Gras. For many years FOPA provides time and space for local artists and volunteers to perform at Mardi Gras for hundreds of guests. All the funds are put towards any local performing arts need based on a wish list made by the community. So one year it might be buying instruments, it might be sending uh, someone on a band trip that can't afford to go, um, helping out the music festival with finances or different things like that. This year there will be non-stop entertainment, local food and Mardi Gras themed outfits. However, all costume themes are welcome. We have a costume contest, so best male, best female, best couple and best group. So you can come as a group themes. We've had, you know, the 80s rockers or... Um, there was a group last year that were Disney villains. And tickets are still on sale for the event on February 11th. It's a really great time of year to kind of get out of the January, February blahs too, right? So um, it's, if you're picking an event, if you want to get out of the house, this is a great one because not only is it a lot of fun, it fundraise, it helps the community in performing arts. And the event has raised over $100,000 throughout the years. This is New Cap Sports. Well, the Lloyd Mr. Bandits continue to make a push for the playoffs and last week made improvements to their lineup, adding some local talent. Friday, the team acquired defenseman Quinn Sobis from the Columbia Valley Ronkies of the Kootenai International Junior Hockey League. The Lloydminster native played part of the 2015-16 season with the Bandits and is excited to be back home. Yeah, um, it's good to be back uh, most of the time. Guys are a bit more hesitant to come to a new team because they don't know some of the guys. But uh, I've been around some of these guys before, so I feel a bit more comfortable. I think he's pretty excited, you know, being away home uh, from home, playing in BC for the last number of years, being back home and playing a lot of boys that he grew up with. His presence gives the team another solid player in the back end and brings skills any team would be happy to have. He's exactly what you want. He's a puck-moving defenseman that really helps us for this year. He's a 20-year-old. So he solidifies our back end for this year and more than anything, he comes back as an overage next year and kind of steps in the shoes that Hunter has right now. He's, an, he's another Hunter Madonna style player, just skilled. We have a lot of guys that are, you know, more accustomed to glassing out, make a first pass and, and just real simple, which is good. You need those guys. They're just as important as the, the Quins and the, the Hunters. Uh, but it's nice to have a guy that, that likes to skate the puck and move the puck and it just gives you another element. To Sobus has three goals and six assists in 26 games, split between the Rockies and the Bandits. Well, now that the World Junior Championship is over, many of the fans and players have had a chance to reflect on Team Canada's silver medal. One of those players, Lloyd Minster native Kale Clagg. The Team Canada defenseman caught up with Newcap Radio's Greg Buchanan on the Tuesday night sports show to discuss his experience at the tournament. It was an unbelievable experience, um, you know, our goal was to go there and win gold, the gold medal, and um, obviously we came up short, but, um, you know, I know there's a few of us on the team from this year that will have another kick at it next year, and I think it motivates, motivates us even more. He also gave his thoughts on making the team, eventually being thrust into the first defensive pairing in the gold medal game against the U.S. You know, I knew coming in I was, you know, a bit on the bubble there to make the team, and going into selection camp, you know, I was lucky enough to make it. And, um, I think it was just a, you know, it was a battle with, you know, myself, Fabril, I was on to, you know, who's going to be in the top, or the third pair there, and so we kind of rotated a bit, and you know, I thought I was playing fairly well, and uh, when my match went down, my name got called, so, um, you know, I was happy about that opportunity, and, um, you know, I thought I did my best. 
Of course, the Canadians' gold medal hopes were dashed in a shootout, a format that doesn't sit well with many fans, including players and, and Clag. No, I don't like I don't like the shootout in that setting. Um, you know, I think continuous overtime would have been would have been good. But I mean, if we if I, if I'm sitting here and we had won, I think I'd maybe say something different. With this being Clag's first year on the team, he's almost certainly a lock to play in next year's tournament in Buffalo.